Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? How are you all doing tonight? How are you doing? Good. <laughs> so my name is Kenyatta A.C. Hingle, and I'm a professor in the Department of Art Practice. We are pleased to host Rhonda Holberton's lecture today in Arts and Design Mondays, a weekly series coordinated by the Office of Berkeley Arts and Design, which is led by Associate Vice Chancellor Shannon Jackson. And we are particularly grateful to the A&D office for supporting the staff and space costs of BAM so that we can host our amazing speakers in this beautiful theater. Ooh. Give it up. <laughs> I want to add that this event is also being supported by the Department of Art Practices Weisenfeld Lecture Series and the Art, Technology, and Culture Colloquium. Oh my gosh, that word. The event for the Weisenfeld Lecture Series is, oh, the next event for the Weisenfeld Lecture Series is this Wednesday, April 3rd, and the British sound and installation artist Haroon Mirza will be speaking about his work at 5.30 p.m. in the Gabale Room. Um, in Stevens Hall, Townsend Center. So I'm going to read Rhonda's bio. Rhonda Holberton holds an MFA from Stanford University and a BFA from CCA. Her multimedia installations make use of digital and interactive technologies integrated into traditional methods of art production. In 2014, Holberton was a, oh my gosh, Kamak. <laughs> the acronyms, I was gonna sound at every single letter, was a Kamak artist in residency at Monet Soussin in France, and she was awarded a Foundation Tineau Fellowship in Paris. Her work is included in the collection of S.F. MoMA and the McEvoy Foundation, and has been exhibited at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, the Contemporary Jewish, Jewish Museum in San Francisco, Transfer Gallery in New York City, Cults in Ami Freiburg exhibitions, Fifi projects in Mexico City, uh, the San Jose Institute of Contemporary Art, and the San Francisco Arts Commission. Holberton taught experimental media at Stanford University from 2015 to 2017 and is currently assistant professor of digital media at San Jose State University. She lives and works in Oakland. Um, so tonight, Rhonda is going to present her interdisciplinary art practice that illuminates the politics of the corporeal body navigating through virtual space. In this presentation, Holberton will discuss her recent projects utilizing networked VR designed to trigger subtle interactions of electrons between biological and digital systems, a speculative cosmetic company whose mission is focused on the potential of products to create distributed performative action and collaborative image making with neural networks. We're living through a crisis of reality. Recent elections across the globe revealed many people living in par parallel but rarely overlapping realities. Today, ubiquitous screens mediate bodily experiences of the physical world. In turn, we are beginning to see digital content shaping material reality. Technologies to deliver augmented and virtual reality will soon become as common as smartphones are today. At the same time, the material environment and physical bodies living within it are approaching a critical moment of climate-induced destabilization that can only be mitigated by collective action. If VR can create a situation in which the user's entire environment is determined by the creators of the virtual world, then it is imperative that the creators of digital worlds take into account the collective needs of the physical one. The solutions to existential problems must come from existential analysis. Broadly speaking, the fields of design and engineering are really good at solving problems. These disciplines are rooted in the figuring out of can we and how to. Great engineers can anticipate the ways a project could fail technically. Art, on the other hand, is particularly good at asking questions, addressing what if rather than how to. Questions like should we? What are all the ways this project could cause failures in other places if it is successful? What are other models? What does it look like if? Great art expands the perimeter of the possible. Holberton's work utilizes materials and platforms that physically connect human bodies through technology highlighting the ways signals of digitally engineered worlds have physical ramifications. 
how the extraction of materials from the environment that support technology are destabilizing the planet, and how we might write better rules for digital platforms that consider the external effects on all bodies and respect the most vulnerable ones. Without further ado, I would like to invite Rhonda Halberton. Hello, thank you for that lovely introduction. I had forgotten that I had given you that second paragraph. It's included in my presentation, so <laughs> you'll get to, we'll revisit, we'll figure out some, some system. Okay. Do I need to do anything on my end for the slides? There it is, great, okay. Thanks, I was just gonna stand here all day. Okay, so uh, Rhonda Wolverton, uh, I'm gonna talk about some uh, two of my most recent projects and then kind of go way back and then come back to the fore again. So uh, I had an exhibition at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. Uh, this was a part of Bay Area Now. Uh, it's a sculptural manifestation exist as yoga mats, uh, six stations where you can go put on a VR headset and then in the center is a sculptural forum that houses a server that I built. And on the server, well, maybe we'll talk more about sculptural manifestation. So in here, we can kind of see the guts of the server. So when you're uh, sitting in the mats, you can log on to, again, for the first time.com. Let's see if this takes us out into, no. Yes. Fantastic. Oh, Safari. Okay, so again, for the first time, <laughs> the online. And, ta -da. Oh, no, 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 we're still in PowerPoint, that's fine. The computer's making a loud noise, I don't know if the mic is picking that up, but I think I broke it. So this is uh, what you see, let's go back in. So welcome, please find a comfortable position uh, with your device, ideally laying down or sitting with the device on your chest near the solar plexus. Relax, allow your energy to come into soft focus. When you're ready, tap the screen of your device to send your energy onto the World Wide Web. Your energy will be stored on a web page hosted on a server inside Yerba Buena Center for the Arts where it will be carefully looked after. The server will be refreshed with periodic energy healings once updated, the healthy energy will be sent back out onto the network. So you tap this screen, you're, you're, you go into full screen mode in your device, the screen will kind of glow white and then fade back down to black. Now what's happening when you're doing that is that inside uh, the server here, it's just a little Raspberry Pi hosting the website. Uh, it's actually storing a little PHP script, is just storing a account. So literally your mechanical energy when you tap the screen is translated into a di digital signal. That digital signal is then transmitted via Wi-Fi to the server and then stored there locally. And now that there is a, a literal transition from that mechanical to electromagnetic uh, to digital energy, but I'm kind of a little bit more interested in playing with this speculative space around that. So what ends up happening is a, uh, a Reiki healer com comes and performs a healing, an energy, energetic healing service on the server periodically and then literally sends clean energy back out onto the network. So when you go into VR, you're looking at uh, used motion capture to record the Reiki session. And then when you go into VR, you see the hands kind of moving over a virtualized body um, for yourself. And each position in the sculptural installation corresponds to the position in VR. So you, there's kind of this one-to-one -one, um, transference of physical space into virtual space. And I, the inspiration for this piece came actually from this photograph. I was really interested, this is um, in Puerto Rico after the hurricane, and really interested in the ways that kind of technology reorients uh, the human experience. Uh, physically here we can see trying to get a better signal, right? And so I was struck by the fact that when I'm, I, I believe 
in bad signals when my cell phone has, you know, um, a poor signal, I, you know, walk around. I totally believe in trying to find a better signal with the cell phone, yet I don't somehow quite wholly believe in energy healing in the body. And like, what, what are the differences? And can I hold these two things at once? And how do they coexist next to one another? I was also thinking about the kind of sculptural element as this manifestation of the kind of infrastructure that supports the, this, these invisible technologies like the cloud or the web. We know they're not really a cloud, right? We know that they're massive servers that are eating up massive amounts of energy, usually offshore or more and more offshore um, due to issues around uh, legal precedent and kind of geography and boundaries. So they do exist somewhere. So thinking about uh, digital technology as kind of part of an infrastructural body. Also thinking about ways that we can, so that was that project we might come back to some of el those elements later, but also thinking about ways that, uh, how do we understand what Timothy Morton here kind of coined the term as hyper object. So these are things that are too massively distributed, uh, in t both spatially and temporally, to really be fully understood by a single human. So these things include things like culture, but they can also include things like the internet, or climate change, or uh, uh, things like, econ like capitalism, right? And so how do we reconcile an individual biological body inside of these massive things. We know that we're kind of moving into the Anthropocene. Humans are literally causing a geologic time scale shift, right? So how do we reconcile this geologic time with the time scale of my body, the time scale of, of humans, and how do we understand this kind of massive shift that needs to happen in order to mitigate some of the, some of the repercussions of the Anthrop Anthropocene? So, I was thinking about things um, <laughs> that we already do <laughs> that, <laughs> that are these kind of metaphoric rituals or like uh, rituals kind of uh, that we perform that connect physical bodies to like hyper objects, right? So here's one. Um, so I created a speculative cosmetic line. Uh, we have a serum, a moisturizer, and a scent. Um, this is the installation of those. So the, I real quick after Europe Buena install, uh, create, became a cosmetic chemist um, and created a company and actually made this product. It's a, it's a legitimate product. It exists in the world. You can uh, go to indexformulations.online uh, and buy it. <laughs> it actually, there's a scent uh, in the installation as well. Um, and so I was interested again in kind of how do I hold these two things at the same time? Is this an art project? Is it a design project? Is it a kind of, is it retail? I'm not really sure where this thing exists in space, but I'm actually kind of okay with not knowing. And the places where this project I think is the most successful is one, I mean, it's an actual product that I use, but also two is in some of the advertising copy. So I leaned heavily into some of the more speculative aspects of some of the active ingredients. And certainly, I mean, advertising copy is kind of weird anyway, right? It's a bunch of these kind of non sequiturs that just kind of get conjoined together in this really abstract kind of way. So it, some of the content in this thing actually kind of passed. And if you can't read it, what, I think I've got it copied. Wait, wait, well, we'll come back to it. So I, I was borrowing language from like radical political theory and like feminist intersectionality and all of these different places and kind of pulling it into the advertising copy and the labeling um, on the products itself. And it reveals itself less in the products and more so online. So, uh, so index formulations announces a new line of procedures developed to protect our collective bodies from a radically changing world and encourage shared capacity for collective creativity, experimentation, and transformation. Um, as the largest organ in the human body, the skin performs many essential functions that help ensure well, our well-being. Of these, most important is providing protection against the multitude of harmful stresses we encounter every day. As vital beings, each of us has the right to nurture ourselves and defend against the effects of environmental toxins. And it kind of goes on and on and on. Um, so uh, again, like letting the language kind of, uh, it kind of passes as kind of a standard advertising co copy for cosmetics, but then some stranger things start happening within it. 
uh, specifically when I start um, talking about like ingredients. So here, this is, um, oh my, all of my notes are have come into PowerPoint gray on gray, which is really fun to read. So this is uh, saying, in the wild, the mycelial networks of mushrooms facilitate underground interplant communication via transfer of nutrients, uh, defense signals, um, and uh, uh, alleochemicals. Right, so this, that kind of is contextualized by some uh, kind of more standard uh, language around what ingredients might do within the body, but also pressing into kind of some of the more like psychedelic aspects of like this rhizomatic mushroom network, but also kind of alluding to maybe digital networks of technology, uh, digital technologies. And then here in the serum, uh, pressing into uh, actives that are, are are on the market that are scientifically proven, but also, again, kind of have these strange attributes. So the brown algae used in index formulations are a large group of multicellular algae that have no roots, stems, leaves, or flowers. They can reproduce both sexually and asexually, containing both asexual spores and haploid cells containing single sets of chromosomes. So you might, like, you might be reading along, reading along, features that are kind of beneficial to the skin and then you bump into something like this and it might it might pass but it might also take you out into another kind of speculative space where you start thinking about this distributed performative action where we're literally rubbing uh, <laughs> minerals we're rubbing rocks we're rubbing like uh, plant biology also synthetic um, components on our skin so I was thinking about this distributed performative action as kind of a reskinning Right? Or that we could all kind of have this, um, we could all be connected by this product that we're kind of applying topically onto our body. And that we could think about this as maybe the beginnings of some type of movement. Right, so my work is really uh, kind of deals with two visions that I have of the future, or anxieties that I have about these two visions. And they're not necessarily compatible visions. One is uh, where our biology and technology are almost indistinguishable. This is kind of a world of science fiction. This is kind of a, a fun place to speculate, but also a terrifying one, uh, depending on how this plays out. And then the second is where the land can no longer support the techno-human agenda, where we literally kind of bonk into the end of our resources. We don't figure out climate change, and we're kind of undone. We are undone by our own kind of progress. I'm going to leave that here, and we'll pivot. We're going to talk about some of my earliest works, um, which I've started including in these talks, um, but it, maybe I'm kind of regretting it now. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, so uh, this is a light bulb. <laughs> it was very impressive for its time. So I think this is like 2004, 2005. And it's an RGB light bulb, and I broke it. Here's it. Here's the light bulb installed. And I, so I, I purchased an LED light bulb. I think it was like forty dollars or something. It was really expensive at the time. Um, it was not RGB. I stuck an RGB um, LED inside of there, uh, attached to a pit controller and a little radio signal. And what this light bulb is doing, and remember. If 2004, this is a time when we had digital photographs, lots of them. They weren't very big, and we didn't really have a place to store them. I think Flickr was just kind of, a, you know, a, in the imagination, uh, wasn't really present, wasn't really being used. So you would just have inside of your computer this massive archive of memories that you didn't necessarily have access to, and they were very small and hard to, to, to see. If you wanted to download an image, it was still, the, the, you know, like dial-up kind of like waiting, you know, 10 minutes for an image. So I wanted to bring these images out into the world. Um, into real physical space. So uh, this is attached, the radio signals uh, attached to, um, this is I think, no, it was actually freestanding. Uh, what it would do is uh, there was a, uh, I think I was using Max MSP, if anybody knows what that is. I, it was taking color averages of photographs and then sending that over the radio signal to this light bulb. So you could literally kind of stand in the presence of your images and allow them to just kind of wash over you. <laughs> And so this project, now I feel better about it. I'm, I'm glad I have this slide. So now that it's, fun, it's funny, but it also like does some heavy lifting. It's kind of like a really easy use case for things that like I will consistently use throughout my practice, right? So one is a threshold between virtual and physical space. 
Another is these specialized methods that are kind of borrowed, adapted, or stolen. And then the third thing is this representation of the vision, of the of the invisible. So how do we actually make kind of physical and see things that are operating behind the scenes that are controlling aspects of our life but are not necessarily readily present or present at hand? So a little bit more background. So I uh, worked as a mechanical engineer before I came back uh, to teaching. Um, this is uh, lots of LEDs. Um, so I w had access to a lot of engineering types of activities and basically taught myself kind of on the job, don't tell my boss, I think he kind of knew. <laughs> I, I made some snow, so this is, I had access to a CNC router, so kind of taught myself three, uh, 3D CNC carving. This is an example of why you don't go on a residency when you're working and let somebody else engineer uh, the project. So this is a curved ceiling, 40 feet up in the air, and we, I came back um, to install this project after having been at, on residence, and the lift did not fit through the door. So note to students, always measure your door of your studio and don't make artwork bigger than your door. <laughs> And measure, measure the door of where it needs to go. All right, so this is me kind of white knuckling. We're trying to figure out whether we can actually span these panels that need to be lifted across these two cherry pickers. And like even just me up there, it's, you know, vibrating. So what we ended up doing, um, and this is, you know, engineering taught in this capacity taught me to uh, think on my feet, which became a really valuable tool for my art practice. And so what I ended up doing was using one of the, the scissor lifts that could fit through the door, and then we used the crates and just kind of piled the crates on. Also, don't tell anyone. Piled the crates on top, and then my acrobatic team of uh, in installers were kind of like on top of the crates. Um, but I also borrowed the, these te technologies in my own work. So this is an example. Uh, so I built a little um, cell phone blocker, uh, and this this circuit sits on top of this brass rod. The ground kind of runs through the rod, so the rod becomes this physical marker of this space uh, that. The first iteration was not very far, and it was only one uh, GSM, I think, network. And then uh, I upgraded. So this is a, an off-the-shelf. I did not make this. This is an off-the-shelf, so it blocks GSM, 3G, 4G, uh, 4G LTE, Wi-Fi, uh, GPS, and it has a jamming radius up to 25 meters. It is not illegal to purchase, um, not illegal to sell in the United Well outside of the United States, it is illegal to turn on. So just <laughs> in case, in case don't, turn, don't, don't turn it on. So I've exhibited this in a few public ins institutions where um, I have the, the circuit kind of uh, available but not necessarily turned on. But I was interested in creating this kind of safe space from tracking, right? So it's both blocking your signal but also creating a safe space. And you can think about this kind of in relationship to the VR Reiki as well, right? creating kind of energetic safe spaces in markers. Um, I think, do I want to talk about this? We'll talk about Roswell at, maybe at a later date. But um, I started doing work. Uh, so part two of this is kind of the investigations of the landscape. Um, so these are all in the Nevada Proving Grounds. So this is a map of. Um, all of the nuclear tests uh, that had been done and the and Nevada Proving Grounds. And I ended up making a, a movie. I'm scared to back out, um, so I'm not going to show you the movie <laughs> so in case I can't get back into my PowerPoint. But it just basically it's a choreography where you zoom into um, each test, and you can see these craters in the, each uh, you can see the test, the underground tests actually leave massive craters on this kind of pockmarked earth. And it zooms in in chronological order. And each of these tests are done in a series, so anywhere from like one bomb drop to like I think up to 19 bomb drops. Um, this, is a this is Julian, uh, so each series has a name. Um, these are photographs that I take while playing the video of the, the kind of zoom in and zoom out for each each of the series, and I just leave the camera open, so let it expose while the video is playing. Do we have any darkroom photographers or photographers in the room? Yeah, right, right. So what happens when you leave uh, something exposed for a really long time? In chemical photography, right, it totally blackens out. In digital world, you get a white, an all-white image. So depending, uh, and you can kind of see like multi, uh, lots of different layers of pixel resolution. 
Uh, so in this case, uh, this is Quicksilver. This is 1978 to 1979. There were 10 de detonations. This is uh, Anvil, 1975 to 1976. This was six de detonations. And this is Buster Jangle. I like that name. This is 1951. Uh, there were seven detonations. Uh, two of them were cratering. And then this is the last one. You can actually kind of make out there is still some visual information there, uh, 1982 to 1983, and there were 19 det detonations here. So I was really interested in this kind of erasure, right, through exposure, and all of the things that kind of came along with that. I was also thinking a lot about um, access to land. Um, so these, there was a tour of the Nevada testing grounds. You could go once a year, they open up to the public, but you have to like leave your cell phones in like the bus. You have to sign a contract saying that you're not gonna like pick up any rocks. <laughs> you know, so all of these kinds of like caveats that are supposed to be like safe, but like, you know, kind of are, are they or, but I really wanted to get in and kind of investigate and like throw myself into, into the landscape and into the dirt. Um, so what I ended up doing was tracing a history of nuclear testing in uh, California. Um, in remediated, remediated landscapes. So this is the Salton Sea, which is a fascinating place. Um, does anyone know? Has anyone seen? Yeah, yeah, right. So there's so many things going on there that I would love to talk about. But it was originally a sea, and then um, uh, was uh, because of changing environment, changing climate, it was a dry desert. It's actually uh, lower than uh, Death Valley in terms of um, um, relationship to sea level. But in the 1916, I think, there was a dam. Uh, they dammed the Colorado River. The dam broke. And then all of this water rushed into this low-lying area, the Salton Sea. And today, it's fed by uh, agricultural runoff. So you have these massive algae blooms because of the agricultural runoff. And then you have these massive fish blooms uh, because of the algae blooms. And then because of the fertilizer content and saline content is so high because of the fertilizer in the, and because it's only being fed by that and evaporating, all of the fish die at the same time. So you have this massive fish die off, they line, it's fascinating. But because the, the, the salinity is so high, it also means boats can run really fast. So the government uh, used this uh, as a test for, for boats, but also as the first water drop test for nuclear bombs. So this is a, in uh, 1944. Um, this is the same shot today. You can still kind of make out the, the landing strip here. And this is a map that I was given. It looked like there were roads out uh, to the test base. They were actually not roads. <laughs> but I'll come back. I'll be digging later, so I'll come back to that. If, if we have time at the end, I'll tell you how I got us out of that. Um, but there were these, <laughs> the reason we were kind of driving off so far is because there are also these beautiful wandering sand dunes, which make their way back into my work. Um, and you can kind of make out, this is uh, my collaborator and then some dogs, and I'm standing on top of the sand dune. So you can kind of get a sense for scale. But I went out there to dig, and I wanted to kind of recreate some of the gestures, these massive explosions, the gesture of the explosion, the craters that I had seen. I was also thinking a lot about land art and the way that we use these uh, seemingly vacant spaces, and who gets to use these spaces, and how do they get used? Um, why do we feel like it's okay to kind of detonate nuclear devices um, in, in deserts, right? So this is Michael Heiser, um, and he's working, and where's my mouse here? Come back here. So this is uh, 1969, Munich Depression. So he's working, you know, I think in a similar way, a lot of the Gutai artists that we see after um, Nagasaki and the Hiroshima bombs were dropped, you see this really kind of physical wrestling with Earth. And I think uh, on the back end, he doesn't talk about this, and none of the land artists really do, but I think must be present at mine was the this massive explosion, right? Kind of dealing with the fallout or the psychological trauma of having dropped a nuclear bomb on, on another country. So, you know, this is just my, my own hunch, but I was interested, rather than making these kind of uh, massive masculine uh, gestures, something that was a little bit more uh, scale of the body, a little bit more human. So these are <laughs> maybe the size of my head. So I would dig a hole, then stand over the hole with my iPhone at the time, take a photo, photograph of that and then use wi wireless signal to kind of 
relay that information back to my computer where I could print it out. And the scale of these, I mean, it's intentionally ambiguous. I remove color data so that it, it isn't kind of specified in terms of locality or like planetary locality either. Um, and I also started working and uh, <coughs> filling these holes, so sculptural forms. Um, making art is a very weird thing. <laughs> that was Hunter's Point. So this is a Hunter's Point. Um, I think I did Lockheed Martin. I did um, uh, Vallejo. But I was also looking at uh, this. So this is the kind of uh, form, formal inspiration. This is Renoui Dome. Uh, this was made in 1979. So you can see here what was going on. The government made massive nuclear tests and then decided rather than clean, the best way to clean up the soil was really literally to dig it out of one place, dig another hole, and then cap it with concrete. So I just, and these are people, you can see kind of these little dark spots, these are people walking on top of it. Um, it's such a beautiful form in, in terms of like land art and displacement, you know, just a really terrifying and, and beautiful and horrific thing to see. So I was kind of interested in maybe mimicking that a little bit. So I, I cut the top off of the, the I made a two-part foam, cast the holes, and then uh, covered it in graphite, which is a, a naturally radioactive resistant material. Um, and kind of just the expressive gesture being something that kind of was trying to mimic the, the blast as well. But while I was doing that, I kept bonking into these fences. So like I would get as close as I could to these sites without you know climbing a fence or breaking in, you know, most of the time. <laughs> and then uh, while I was, so this, I got really interested in that kind of like, what is the boundary? What is the fence really? And so I would kneel in front of these gates and I had a two part resin and I would roll the resin out on the street uh, or whatever uh, surface there was between me and the fence and uh, record that texture. And then like, I would rub that resin down with graphite again. So here's kind of a closer texture and my mobile studio. So I think that those, those earlier projects uh, do a great job of kind of e exploring this triad, uh, which is still present in my work, although it's kind of taken a very, a uh, little bit different form. Um, so th that triad, right, is landscape, perception, and the body mediated by technology. The sand dunes make their way back into this installation uh, with Amy Freeberg exhibitions in, uh, at Maco in Mexico City. Um, the wallpaper is made up, some of the photographs are actually from the Salton Sea that I took, but mostly it's a composite of like Sahara, Gobi Desert, deserts kind of around the world. And this is made during the kind of very beginning of the drought here in California. So water and water use was very, very much kind of uh, present in my mind. This is a, a fabric sculpture I made. It's actually a bunker that I reconstructed in 3D. So there's two layers. This is the internal layer. Then there's an external layer. And I made a, a fabric pattern. And then I took, looking back at the bunker, I was really interested in this kind of oppositional viewpoint. So the bunker kind of looks out in the water. I stare back at the bunker and take photographs of the landscape and then made a, a kind of camouflage out of the, the photographs I had taken staring back at the bunker. And on the left, yeah, left, uh, is the kind of composite image. And then on the right is something that's called a bump map. Does anybody know what a bump map is? Any gamer? Yeah, okay, okay. So what it, it does is basically when you're uh, making 3D models, you can either add more geometry to get kind of like complexity in, in your models, or you can do things that kind of trick or are, are tricks that are computationally efficient ways to get the same uh, texture without the additional comp computation of geometry. That's called a bump map, and it's usually, it can be these purple-like gorgeous images or just a black and white image. And so the image on the left you see is just the image texture, the image on the right is using a bump map. So I was thinking about the images as a way to kind of fake like physical presence, but also as a way to kind of camouflage and also thinking about kind of rendering this really heavy, brutalist architecture as something like more soft and feminine. Um, <clears throat> I was also making rocks. So these are, 
a free 3D model uh, that I found, this, which I actually went back to find the source image for this. So it's been downloaded, what, like 20K times. So this is this rock, actually, I didn't know this, it has a an actual real life kind of progenesis. So this is a basalt rock that was found in, in Australia and then 3D scanned, and now has been downloaded over 20,000 times. So it kind of populates all of these virtual environments. So <laughs> I was, wanted to kind of bring that rock back out into kind of physical reality again. So it's just CNC routed, uh, printed in three different sizes, and then covered with a hard foam. This is show up. Yeah, okay, so this is a, uh, one of the, it's, this is still up. This is at the Contemporary Jewish Museum. It's an excellent group uh, show that I'm a part of, um, honored to be a part of. Fabulous artists included in the exhibition. Uh, the the video and this is mine. This is Isabella Yellen's uh, sculptural work. And in the front, we there's a, a mannequin. And I've been thinking when I was making this. Well, I'll just show you. So it's made using a similar technique, uh, the same technique that. Uh, medical supply companies will use to produce suture test pads. So it has the same density and elasticity of, as human skin, which is a horrible thing to like pick up and lug around just like this, like, uh, anyway. My own work creeps me out frequently. <laughs> I'm just pulling that out there. It's a little bit darker than I intended, but also kind of seductive and beautiful. So I was thinking about, in this case, this this image, I had done a made a yoga mat. So this is the skin made to yoga mat proportions, right? So thinking about this kind of like unrolling of skin, maintenance of the body. In this case, I made the black mat um, the same cubic yeah so it's this has the same surface area as like the average human body whatever that means average human body and then covered the human form with it so thinking about the skin and the screen as these sites of kind of like intervention and interplay between the kind of interior psychic self and this kind of exterior physical world um this one i do want to play so let's see what happens when i do that so this is uh <laughs> okay come back out so this is made using a 3D scan, and this is um, while I was working um, as an engineer, I had been using 3D models frequently, but hadn't really animated um, any of them. So this is the first time uh, I tried to animate uh, one of my 3D models, not recommended for uh, my first animation, start with the bouncing balls, definitely. <laughs> so I had a vision, and it was partly while I was making the yoga mat, um, but I just had a vision of these scans that I was doing, which were really broken. And here, I'll just pull them out. So they're these really kind of broken, fragmented scans, which made the, the scan itself almost feel more real, um, but also rendered the body as completely broken, distorted, or in, in need of some type of maintenance. And I, when I saw those scans, I'd been working with them for a while, and I just saw this image of one of them trying to repair itself, you know, in this, uh, through this kind of uh, uh, vinyasa yoga practice. So, um, so instead of the bouncing balls, I decided to try to animate a vinyasa yoga sequence using a totally broken uh, model. And I don't know if you guys know anything about how you're actually supposed to animate and inverse kinematics. I did not know any of that at the time. So lit almost every keyframe on this is is keyed. And like in order to kind of you know tip the model over, I like wrote, I like made little markers on the screen and like tape, would tape, literally put tape on my screen so that when I rotated my model, I could put the arms back down where, where they had been before. I knew nothing, right? But there was something wonderful that happened. Like I couldn't make the same animation today. I just know too much, like I'm too adept. And I, this is another thing that I, I constantly try to do, which is push into both my own capabilities, but also the capabilities of the technology. And when the, both the technology and I are kind of pressed into our limits, there's this interesting thing that starts happening, right? So there, there's like a, just like bad animation, the feet kind of skid, it moves in and out of looking like it could be like a, a real body, but also completely false. And I, th I think that that was uh, a really interesting place for me to work. Um, let's see, go back here. And in the, also in the, the installation is uh, Ascent. So this is, you know, this is, you can see kind of the logic um, uh, 
throughout my work. I returned a couple different themes, right? The cosmetics and then the scent. But this was uh, developed, uh, I was doing research for uh, another project and found this white paper from the CIA, Human Scent and Its Detection, which describes a mechanical dog that can use human scent to identify you. It is more accurate than retinal or thumbprints. <laughs> And it also has the added benefit of not needing your consent to be taken. <laughs> so I requested, uh, through the Freedom of Information Act, I requested from the CIA that they send me their, this white paper that I found uh, that was made reference of. And then this is what I got back, and I love this so much. Who is addressing at the CIA <laughs> with this? This is amazing. And then this is CSI CIA with a bunch of, like, can I write to that? I love that address. It's amazing. So good. Um, but it turns out that the, the, the method that they were using to develop this scent um, was the same that you would use for volatile uh, fragrances that are found in things like white flowers also feces, but you know, whatever. Uh, so, so I, so I uh, cold, it's a cold distillation process. So I cold distilled, I had human volunteers wear these t-shirts for a month and then I used it, the same method, the cold distillation process to distill their scent and then bottle it. So there's three scents in this case. Uh, three volunteers. So it's meant, you can't smell anything, so it's meant both as this kind of provocative design object, but also would actually work, you know? So if you spray this on yourself, you're going to thwart the, the mechanical dog that the CIA had developed. Um, jumping a little bit of, around in time, this is um, at Cult Amy Freeberg Exhibitions. Uh, this is a project that kind of started We'll talk about this a little bit later. I'll just talk about what this thing is. All right, so uh, there's a, there were a few kernels. Usually in my practice, like with the yoga piece, for instance, I'll get a flash and like I'm, I just have to make it. There were a few that kind of, I didn't know if they were in the same show together or, or what the deal was that happened. And the first one was this um, honey. It was uh, a honey piece. So this is the image that inspired it. And um, I'll come back to these, these images that I was finding in these culture magazines a little bit later. Um, but when I saw this image, I was like, this is a crazy thing. So somebody, no, back up. There were a bunch of bees, probably in a hive that we've made. They made a honeycomb. Somebody pulled the honeycomb out of the hive, probably packaged it up, is maybe sold it by right as this fancy like couture food. And then some stylist pulled that honeycomb out of by right, brought it into the studio, hung it up on the wall, and poured other bees' honey over it. That is a crazy sequence of events, right? And it somehow it kind of makes sense in this context. So the, the same thing that I was talking about where the advertising copy can be very psychedelic and strange. We're like, oh, yeah, sure, that makes sense. The, the same thing's happening here with this image, right? Like we're kind of get desensitized to the, the strangeness of human behavior because it kind of makes visual sense or it's kind of like well within the logic of capitalism, right? So how do we kind of pull as much value out of our materials, out of our objects, and out of our images? Side note, this honeycomb is actually sideways. <laughs> so honeybees don't, don't uh, they make their honeycombs with the flat side at the bottom, not with the point. So just, you know, wanted to point that out. <laughs> I was also interested, so there, I was interested in that image because it's so crazy, you know, subtly crazy, but also, I, you know, thinking a lot about um, drones and I had been doing some reading about insects and the kind of insects as model for uh, military development. Uh, so this uh, is a uh, Actually, uh, Jack, uh, who is here, Kosek, not necessarily here tonight, but is a researcher here at Berkeley, teaches in um, geography. geography. Thank you. Uh, so he's writing, a, he's, he did a study of, of bees and of drones, and he's saying the world uh, designating military drones comes from the word for bee. This is true all over the world in countless languages. Partly because of this linguistic consistency, it is common misperception that drones take their name from buzzing sound when unmanned aircraft fill the air. More accurately, however, drones trace their entomological lineage to the male honeybee that is called a drone. The male drone bee is distinguished from the female worker bees. It does no useful work and has one single function to impregnate the queen bee. What unites the military drones with their apiary namesake is not sound, but thoughtless purposefulness. 
So this is, oh dear, back out. Let's see if this computer likes that. Probably not. So this is the, the animation. I was thinking about all of those things kind of combining together into, into one uh, speculative animation. And I saw that kind of loop. I saw that image, that strange image that I had seen before, um, but animated. So I was thinking a little bit about, let's see if I can uh, enter full screen. So I was thinking a little bit about the kind of like militaristic roots, but also the kind of surveillance roots, thinking about hierarchies of power within like a, a B social schema, um, but also thinking very much about extraction and labor. So um, thinking about linear in this, this model, like that honey just kind of keeps pouring out of it as this kind of like offering, this kind of like massive offering of capital and, and within capitalism of a natural resource. At the same time in the installation, um, I was also raising mosquitoes. Um, I raised the generation of mosquitoes um, on me and uh, harvested gold out of the California landscape. I won't really talk about those, but thinking about material resources and who gets to, <laughs> where value comes from and, and who harvests value and who has access uh, to those harvesting technologies. Um, I do a lot of weird things in my practice. I mean, I see, you know, uh, I'll get a flash of something and then I just have to do it. Um, and I learn a lot in the process. Mostly with the mosquitoes, I learned that feeding mosquitoes is very boring. Very, very boring. So may maybe you'll get like, I would, I would just sit there and most of the time nothing would happen. A single female can uh, re make, oh man, I forget the, the actual count, but most of the time it was not, I was actually not being bit. And there were other strange things that ended up happening. Anyway, so um, I will come back back to that in a bit, but that original image that we saw was from a, one of these lifestyle magazines like Kinfolk or Serial Magazines. I don't know if you guys know what they are, but you've, you've probably seen images like this. So this is uh, Kinfolk, this is Serial, and I noticed, so I <laughs> went to a psychic, um, as you do <laughs> when you're worried about the future, and <laughs> I, I was I was hoping that I could extract our like elements of our conversation and like write this kind of speculative script and it was going to be this whole other animation thing but it ended up getting super personal. She was <laughs> yeah who knew psychic. Uh, so, so she she gave me an assignment and she said I want you to imagine a happy healthy home and this is your homework and go go do this. I'm like, okay, I've got this. Like, you know, I'm, I'm gonna go meditate and I'm gonna like think about a happy, healthy home. And like, I couldn't really do it. Like I could see like perfect studio, but I couldn't do like home. And then I kept getting these little like flashes, these little like tabletop vignettes. I'm like, where are these images coming from? And then I realized it's like, oh my God, like even in my like most meditative state, like Kinfolk Magazine is like bored this little like aesthetic hole into my brain. And that is all I can see. <laughs> so I started taking, but then I also kind of realized that I kind of already own a lot of these objects. So I just started making 3D scans of my own objects and tried to recreate the pictures that I'd seen. So a stack of baskets, I'm like, yeah, I got that basket. Some tennis shoes and a purse. <laughs> a dumb sweater that I slept in. <laughs> oh, this is a really interesting one. So like. The insidious thing about kinfolk is that they are kind of inserting advertising and with these like super artfully done aesthetic images. So you're not really sure that you're, you're not aware that you're necessarily being sold to, right? Like in this case, the shoe can like kind of face up away from you, kind of just stick its butt out at you. It's like so great. It's like not even the whole shoe. So like, like I would kind of reinterpret these things. Um, and so once I had these images, I didn't know where it, where it lived. So then I was like, oh, well maybe it just like lives as a magazine again. So I made a print magazine with these images, had, had some like uh, <laughs> articles written in there. Um, but I actually think it was most successful when I incorporate it back into the sphere of kind of social media. So I, I created an Instagram account that was solely do devoted to this, ronholberton.com, and I started tagging things with like, uh, <laughs> Sunday morning. And then this was really interesting. So like uh, handmade ceramics. So I used handmade ceramics a lot in my posts and I ended up with this like following of bespoke kind of crafters. It was really, and, and I wasn't trying to like make fun or anything. It's just like something like intentionally with the hashtags, like it just kind of see these things seep out into the world, right? And so somebody's asking, is that some sort of funny clay or is that the glaze? 
It's like, actually, that's just a hole in the scan. But it's like really interesting, right? Like when you're looking at these things on devices, you, your attention span is not that great. And also like the images are quite small. So these images could kind of pass through networks that they wouldn't have, have in print or like if I had, you know, put them on the wall. Some of them are more obvious that they're like scans and that there's holes in them. And then I uh, kind of created a, 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 a composite of these things. And so that also in the exhibition, so that the still life stuff was kind of in the front, the kinfolky stuff. And then you had to walk through this little hallway to get to the, the, the exterior or the back room, which is where the mosquitoes and the like gold stuff was. Um, so this is a rear projection. And uh, how do I want to do this? I'm going to show you how I made it and then we can actually look to see what it is. So uh, I the room existed in the gallery space. I taped out that same uh, size room in my studio. I made a 3D model that was two scale of that room. I took a 3D scan of a male model and then I put my movement using motion capture onto him. And so you can kind of see like the hips get stretched out. There's like, you know, some, some moments that are really kind of quite, quite awkward in, in that translation. But I was really interested in, in ways that like visual, like visuality, who gets to be seen, who gets to be the one being shown and who's like dictating movement. So I was really interested in kind of playing around with that. So I'm going to show you dancing bones first and then we'll take a look at the, the finished piece. So this is dancing bones. You can see uh, right foot, left foot. I'm using a Connect sensor, which is the same device that I'm using to make 3D scans. So it can, it will send out 3D coordinate system for like head, shoulder, elbow, but it's like not entirely accurate, right? You can kind of see that there's like lots of moments where the computer and the technology is kind of voguing with me, like we're, we're kind of working together with this like skinned body of a, a third party all within this kind of virtualized space. And so I danced in front of the Kinect and then um, rendered it in the, in the uh, let's see, in the model, I think you can kind of see here, there was a, a scrim on the face. So this, when I render through this, I gave it like a frosted glass material. So the camera is actually looking kind of through this material at this figure that's lit from behind. And then inside the gallery, I am rear projecting that image onto frosted glass, right? So it's kind of recreating. And what ends up happening is this kind of spooky, really subtle. Awkward voguing. And, and so one of the things that ends up happening, you can kind of see like when the, the arms kind of come closer to the screen, it, it, it's in clearer register. When the body kind of is further back, you just kind of see this soft kind of shadow. So because you had to walk, the, it was a narrow hallway, you had to kind of walk right next to this thing. It actually could be quite startling. I actually kind of freaked myself out working there late a few times and walking past this thing. And, just, and part of that is because we're... Uh, using our peripheral vision to view it, right? So our peripheral vision is actually kind of bypasses a lot of the, the frontal cortex stuff that has to do with logic and language, and it goes straight into flight or fright mode. So I was interested in, in uh, thinking about that kind of frontal ver vision versus the peripheral vision that we get to play with um, when we're doing things like virtual reality, for instance, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> but also like what, what, what happens, right, when we're kind of focused on a very narrow point. And why is virtual, like virtual reality, why, why does it work so well? Why do I get seasick? Why, do I, why does my stomach turn when I walk through walls? So this is the point where I was going to uh, read a, a bit of elegant text that I had written that Kenyatta was able to read beforehand, but maybe we can revisit that, some of the, that content now, um, just having seen some of this work. So, um, all right, so we are living through a, a crisis of reality, right? This is not necessarily a new thing, right? But the election of 2017 has revealed these over, uh, like parallel but not necessarily overlapping realities. And uh, today, screens mediate bodily experiences of the physical world. In turn, we are beginning to see digital content shaping material reality. 
Collective memories form the basis of history, and people's understanding of history shapes how they think about the future. This is the Bowling Green massacre did not exist. Technologies to deliver hands-free mixed reality displays will soon become as common as smartphones are in 2018, 19. At the same time, the material environment and the physical bodies living within it are approaching a critical moment of climate-induced destabilization that can only be mitigated by collective action on a massive scale. So, if VR can create a situation in which the user's entire environment is determined by the creators of virtual world, then it is imperative that the creators of those virtual worlds take into account the collective needs of the physical one. Good engineers can anticipate the ways a project could fail technically. On the other hand, art is particularly good at asking questions, addressing the what if rather than the how to. Questions like, what are the ways this project could cause failures in other places if it is successful? So interactive di digital technology is an integral part of that, right? So I submit, like this is a simplified system, right? And like any good system, there's like some feedback cycles that uh, are in there that I omitted for the sake of clarity and beautiful graphics. <laughs> so I, art's really good at touching people at like a prelingual or kind of a motive level, right? And so I think when we're asking arts to kind of talk about their impact statements in like a concrete way, that's not really what art is good at doing, right? Nor would I necessarily think that making the art that I do is somehow going to kind of fit into the scheme over here. It's not necessarily going to one-to-one -one create a kind of a resistance movement, but it might open up the possibilities for speculating about uh, politics and, and the ways that we engage with technology and politics. So on that, I submit that the best way to find our way back to reality is through a speculative investigations using the same platforms that undermine it. So I think I, I left some time, yeah, if anybody has any questions. Otherwise, I can show you a movie of a UFO. Yeah. Oh, wait, do we have a mic? Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Melissa. Um, I had a question about VR and foveated rendering. When VR can actually utilize that, what would be your thoughts on um, what you were mentioning about peripheral vision versus frontal cortex and jumping to fight or flight? So uh, can you repeat what kind of rendering? Foveated rendering. Tell um, me more. Uh, it's an upcoming technique where in VR it utilizes eye tracking oh. so that in VR if I'm looking at a certain area that will focus and the outside of it would blur. Blur. And then if my eyes are actually looking at another area in VR, it would focus on that. Whereas right now, like when you're in VR, everything is kind of in focus, depending yeah. on the game. I mean, that, that's like, so that's one of the things with like, you know, uh, physical lenses, right? So like physical lenses and cameras mirror the optics of our eyes, right? So when we're looking out into the world, our, our focus is actually quite narrow, right? Like we're just kind of like darting between the peripheral and what we're looking at. So I think that's really interesting, right? What it might do, one, they're probably developing it because it makes people less sick, right. I'm imagining. Yeah. Um, so it's actually, I think I've, I would be interested in using that as a curatorial device within VR, but I'm also really interested in the ways that that kind of hyper definition, that hyper um, focus actually messes with our body. I actually, like, the, again, those are the places where I'm like, oh, that's right, territory. Whereas the designers are trying to get rid of that feeling, I would probably push into it. But I do think in terms of, like, focus, scope, and attention, that's a way that you could literally, like, force people to look at certain things and not look at other things. And that might be more scary in terms of augmented reality, right? So if we're getting better at displaying the real world, being able to direct people's attention within that real world is, is kind of a scary thought.
thought. And it might be imperceptible, right? Like this would be something that would happen kind of on a physiological level. Hi, great talk. Um, so a lot of your work is about uh, taking or taking like something in the physical world and then bringing it into the digital world and then maybe even like uh, bringing it back into the physical world. Um, what uh, what are some topics you might consider exploring with things that only exist uh, in the digital world? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, so. Um, when I was thinking about the that rock, for instance, that I had made, I didn't realize that it was actually sampled off of a real world thing. I actually kind of like that conceptually, but in in the original intent of the work, I was interested in taking something like a labor that somebody had made, both like cognitively but also physically in terms of their digital like output labor, and taking something that had only existed psychically or digitally and like making it physically manifest. But I'm also like, does anything exist only in the digital world, right? So if somebody's designed it, there's a like a chemical interaction that's happening in our brain, a mechanical kind of action that's creating it, and then this digital artifact of that experience. So maybe there's something that could exist only in the digital realm. I'm not sure. I'd have to give that a think. Right, because like if it is, if it exists, then it's been something has created it and saved it. It's plugged into the wall that's you know sucking energy out of dead dinosaurs. So I don't know, like, <laughs> like I don't, I'm not sure that something could only be digital yet, maybe. <laughs> but I like that question a lot. I mean, probably my next work. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering how far you took, I mean, when I looked at the animation of the lady doing yoga, um, I thought of ancient Greek sculpture, the Venus de Milo, and I'm wondering if that was part of where you were going with that. It seems like a joke on antiquity um, and decay and, I don't know, actually the male gaze on female bodies. Yeah, absolutely, right? So like, one, there's like this sad broken body inside of the screen that's trying to maintain itself, but it's, it's it's modeled on a real world phenomenon, right? Which is the kind of maintenance of the body and feeling like it's like always kind of broken and, and specifically like that tends to come through a feminist reading or like a, a reading of the male gaze, right? So uh, what does it mean to try to maintain the body outside of like healthy standards, right? And why do we do that? And what are those kind of, where do those standards come from? I wasn't, I don't, I think like the, the kind of classical sculpture makes its way into a couple other projects of mine that I had made around the same time where I, like I had dressed up in riot gear and made a 3D scan of myself. Riot gear and like football gear and other protective gear. And so that starts like looking kind of like wings, but also these other other things. Um, but it's definitely part of it. it, wasn't my original intent. But what happens when I'm making these pieces, I'm actually, I've always been such an admirer of like painters who are creating images from nothing. Like I always start very much in the real world, like a scan of a body it is doing yoga. And then like whatever kind of aesthetics fall out from that, fall out from that. Uh, but yeah, I, I was thinking in that realm, but not specifically about that connection, but I like it. One in the back, then one in the very front, then one in the very back. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned that your work is about um, finding the threshold between virtual and physical space. And I was wondering how you quantify, research, or interpret that, if at all. Yeah, I think the screen is a really easy go-to for that, right? Like the screen is this kind of liminal space. But I also kind of trouble that, right? So in the, the Reiki, so like forcing electrons into digital and then kind of like pulling them back out. Um, and I think once you start trying to define where that translation happens, 
at least on a phenomenological level, it gets really gray and really slippery really quickly. And I like that. Like it becomes, you know, super psychedelic, very strange. Like those, those boundaries are harder to, to kind of identify the more uh, you think about it and the kind of more granular you get in those interactions. That is all of the questions. <laughs> yeah. the one in, There's two we could do. It. Battle the microphones. Oh. Hi. Hi. Um, I have a question about the index formulations project, which seems pretty recent, right? Is, I have lots that, of questions like about it. Like the freshest yes, one? Yeah. Okay. Um, just listening to you talk about it, it, it feels to me like it's active. It's interesting for you as a writing project more than, than any of the other pieces that you talked about, actually. And I wonder if, is that true? And, um, and or what do you make of how... Um, involved you were in that as a writing project? Yeah, so that's a good question. So when I, when I frame that project as an art project, the art, I think, happens in the writing. And so I'll, I'll tend to talk about the writing more than I would like the formulations um, in this context. But in other contexts, I would talk more about the formulations, which I also find fascinating, right? Like there are uh, chemical interactions that like uh, hold that where the like, <laughs> it's, it's like fascinating. Like, like I couldn't combine certain things because they just don't work, right? Like the, the there, it has to emulsify. There are certain things that have to be there. That, that there's other things that can't be there. And so, kind of finding that that triad was actually really interesting. Um, and I just liked the mechanics of kind of like a little powder and like you know the the kind of detailed measurement of it. But it also arose out of um, me being diagnosed, and this is kind of part of the psychic conversation too, but being diagnosed with an autoimmune disorder and uh, figuring out that like the hippie products that I was using that had like lavender in it were actually uh, totally toxic and overstimulating my immune system. And so I, I, I tried to, I would, you know, read through all the ingredients and it would be perfect, 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 and then it would be one thing in, in a product. And so part of it developed out of, like, like, like I was thinking about my body kind of reacting to the environment, but also the, the root cause of it, while we haven't really pinned that down, it's triggered by stress and triggered by things like, poli like me thinking about politics and, like, the future and climate change, right? And so the, there's this kind of, like, lovely interplay that's, like, happening even within the kind of root cause of the kind of research inspiration that kind of is mirrored in, in the copy, the advertising copy, right? And so making language around this like physical thing became really important to me. And because I had been so immersed in kind of like ingredient listings, I mean, I made this, it's called index because I made this massive spreadsheet and would tr like track all of my, my symptoms. It's a, symptom tracker, but I wanted, you know, because I'm an engineer, reinvent the wheel, right? <laughs> but but uh, so I en ended up with this like massive index and I could take like copy and paste like a list of ingredients and then it would just auto populate with like all of the known triggers, right? And, and I called that sheet index and I was working with that for like two years before I kind of started on the project. So there's this kind of like linguistic heritage in, in the kind of diagnoses and some of the, the physical stuff that was happening. Hi. <laughs> Can you go back to the last slide before this one? Mid previous? No. It was the one where you did a search, Facebook is. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that one. Thank you for the talk. That was really incredible and lovely to see all of your artwork finally and, and everything coming together. The one thing that I'm struck by uh, is in these last few slides, this notion to talk about these platforms that you've essentially deconstructed in that really theoretical sense of the term, recreated in terms of the body, and then also your last slide was that we can use these to get back to humanity or the body, making that a metonymy of the body, right? And then the last slide, and the last thing that says Facebook causes cancer. Oh, right. yeah. yeah, yeah. 
So I'm wondering, and this is a similar question I asked you and Jonathan last week, this, I think, I think what you're doing is talking about trying to revise the way that we think about the body and the digital implications of all of these platforms and problematizing that, but at the same time, not skirting of offering an answer or a resolution as if it's an easy thing to do. But with some of the, these things politically that you've implicated, like Facebook, how can we ever see to deconstruct them and then go back to them for some of these resolutions of things that we've created? Yeah, so I, I, I don't have the answer, but my answer is to misuse it, right? Like to expose like where it breaks. And that's, you know, when we use art as a tool for careful analysis, the strangeness of that honeycomb image reveals itself, right? And it starts tugging on a lot of other threads where like the seamlessness of the product belies its messy and kind of biased history, right? And so when we misuse it, we expose some of those threads and we can start pulling on it. So it's not to say that I think Facebook's going to be the thing that saves us, but I think using it in a way that exposes the mech machine behind it will allow us to kind of like get back there with our tools and maybe tweak the machine, write better rules. Right, make engineer better products with 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 these goals as a primary kind of embedded at the beginning, not tacked on at the end. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> I think we're out of time, but if you want to see UFOs, email me. I'll, I'll send it to you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs>